All right. Thank you, Larry. I do hope you'll stop by our, our visitor center that was mentioned. I think, uh, how many of you have already been through it? Let me see. In the Revels building. All right. Especially those of you that are new to the conference, go to the Revels building after the sessions and go into that guest center and walk through it. It's interactive. It's got a lot of videos and it tells a great story that we want you to see. And it, I think it will inspire you for some things in your own ministry. And uh, thank you, Larry, for all the work you've done as our conference coordinator this year. And uh, it is uh, Larry's, uh, Larry is responsible for the fact that I am not wearing a tie today. And so for those of you that hate ties, you can uh, thank him when you see him, all right? So yeah, there we go. Um, we'll talk more about that in the generational session with Pastor Reed on the older and the younger. So. But uh, anyways, uh, we're really glad uh, again to welcome you this morning. You're doing very well. Uh, some of you didn't get here right at 1014, but most of you did. So uh, thank you for that. Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, you should have received the packet and you should have received the notes for this session. And both will be helpful to you as we uh, go along this morning. Thank you, uh, Steve, for the session this morning on the culture of the church. Sometimes we focus more on the culture outside of the church. We get ticked off and it ruins the culture in the church. And so that was helpful to me. And thank you, General Teichert, for reminding us of what it means to be a servant leader. First Corinthians chapter three, and we're going to read a verse that I quickly quoted last night in the message, but I'd like to begin here today. I've entitled this message, this lesson, uh, evangelistic collaboration through the local church. And for those that are here for the first time in the conference, uh, in the mornings we do some teaching and preaching. We, we want it to be uh, equipping in nature. We have preaching, of course, at night. A lot of great sessions coming up after this and this afternoon. Uh, but I hope that there'll be some things that you glean in this session, both spiritually and also uh, methodologically, that will help you as you get back to the ministry. And so we're going to begin with this passage, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse number 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? It's an interesting word, is it not? Something we would not want to live as a labeled person this way, and yet Paul was labeling the church in this way fleshly. So he says, who, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Today we're speaking about evangelistic collaboration for the, for the worldwide mission emphasis that needs to be renewed today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to collaborate within our church and with other churches to reach souls. Help us in this session uh, to... Uh, glean and to grow and to take things that we can apply in our own ministries and bless every church represented here, Lord, whether it's a church of 50 or 5,000. Every church is important. You love them. You died for them. Help us to reach the potential you intend for us to reach and help us to learn how to remove barriers and to grow. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. After 40 years of preaching the gospel, it's sad to me how some things need to be learned over and over again. There's some lessons that you have to come back to and be reminded of. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 teaches us that we must learn to work together in order to see evangelistic fruit. We must learn to work together, to collaborate in order to see more people saved. 
for whatever reason, sometimes we struggle with this in our churches and we struggle with this when it comes to fellowshipping with other churches to plant churches and to expand the gospel's emphasis. It kind of reminds me of an old uh, Peanuts cartoon where Lucy walks in and she demands that Linus change the TV channels. And she says to Linus, she says, if you don't change the channels, you're going to get this. And uh, Linus said, well, what makes you think that you can just walk right in here and take over like that? And Lucy says, these five fingers. She said, individually, they are nothing. But when I put them like this, they are a mighty fighting unit. And Linus said, okay, what channel do you want? (laughs) Turning away from Lucy, he looked at his hand and he said, why can't you guys get your act together like that? Do you ever wonder that about your church? Do you ever wonder that about perhaps church planning or missions? Why can't we get our act together? Why does it appear that the gay agenda works more closely for their cause than we work for our cause? Today we want to learn about collaborating, not compromising, but collaborating for the sake of the gospel ministry. Now, there are some key takeaways from the text we just read, and I share them with you briefly. We notice in verse number four that division over personality is often indicative of carnality. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and I am, uh, the other, I am of Apollos, are you not yet carnal? I have been in the ministry a long time now, long enough to say that most of the division that I have seen amongst Baptists, especially independent Baptists, has not been over doctrine. There has been some of that. We see in the Southern Baptist Convention, the majority of these folks going woke, and uh, some of the Southern Baptists that I know that are still in that convention, they, they would say in more, much more stronger terms than I would that there's outright doctrinal compromise happening in their convention and so forth. And, and that's sad when you hear of that. And there's been some of that in, in the Independent Baptists and so forth. But most of what I have seen with respect to dividing and separating under the guise of separation has not been about doctrine. It's mostly been about personality and institution. And so we learn from this text that, that many times that can be carnal. Are you not yet carnal? The second takeaway that we see from verses 5 and 6 is that collaboration in unity for souls is the heart of God for his church. He wants his whole church working together for souls. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. This is God's heart that we work together to reach souls. In verse 6, we learn that any true fruit in our ministries comes from God. God gave the increase. And then we learn finally in this passage, and and very clearly in verse 9, that we are laborers together with God. And so this is a rich passage when it comes to the idea of working together, one planting, uh, others uh, watering, others harvesting, and God giving the increase. And as we see Satan unleashing attacks today on the church, we are reminded that soul winning and evangelism is going to be a collaborative effort that we must work together in the power of the Holy Spirit to see a great work done for God. And this statement uh, does not mean that, that we do not have an individual responsibility. We'll see that in just a moment. But it is to say that everyone in the church needs to be a part of the soul winning ministry. Dr. John R. Rice used to say, give me a hundred soul winners a week in the church and you'll see a thousand people on Sunday morning. I actually believe there's great truth to that statement still to this day. Every member, training every available member in soul winning. Now, how's that going to happen in the local church where you serve? And by the way, how many of you would love to see a doubling, a tripling, a quadrupling of the number of people out soul winning in your church during this upcoming fall season. How? How does that happen? If you would notice, first of all, we must emphasize a yielded life, yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. 
We must yield to the Holy Spirit. Collaboration begins first between myself and the Holy Spirit of God. Yieldedness, 1 Corinthians 3.16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Letter A, the Holy Spirit guides our witness. God wants us to be guided and to be led by the Spirit. There are five commandments regarding the Holy Spirit's ministry. We see in the the New Testament, we're commanded in Galatians to walk in the Spirit. We're commanded in Jude to pray in the Spirit. We're commanded in Ephesians not to grieve the Spirit. We're commanded in 1 Thessalonians that uh, we are to not quench the Spirit. And in Ephesians 5.18, the great commandment that states we are to be filled with the Spirit. Not one time does the New Testament command us to speak in tongues, but over and over and over again, we're commanded to be yielded to the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, and, uh, and to, to seek the power of the Holy Spirit. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Holy Spirit purifies our hearts and our motives. And, and the fact is that God is looking today for men and women that are walking in the power and in the purity of His Spirit. Uh, you see, uh, the preacher is the sermon. You cannot separate uh, the character and conduct of the preacher from the message. And so God, before we even speak, is looking that for us to be a people filled with the Spirit and guided by the Spirit and walking by the Spirit. I believe it was author Ted Tripp who said, pastoral ministry is always shaped by a war between the kingdom of self and the kingdom of God, which is fought on the field of your heart. And that battle between the, the lust of the flesh and the, and the Holy Spirit of God, uh, it is a real battle. And we must learn daily to die to self and seek the fullness of the Spirit. And I'm going to tell you something uh, that, that most of us have finally learned. And, and we're not against having leadership requirements and standards. But if you can get a Christian completely filled with the Spirit of God, you don't have to have a standard telling him he has to go soul winning. You don't have to tell him what kind of television to watch. It's a great thing when someone realizes the living God is within me and he'll guide them and direct them in holiness and in in soul winning power. And so uh, we must recognize the the need and the necessity of the Holy Spirit purifying our life and then the Holy Spirit teaching us. Uh, The Bible says in John 14, 26, but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost whom the the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. I don't know about you, but one of the most glorious experiences that I have in soul winning is when I, when I sit down, and we, we teach uh, people how, how to be a soul winner. We have a book on the table in there called Take It Personally. If you're new to the conference, you've never used that, buy one for everybody, have a class if you sign up 20 or 40 and get them involved in that. We'll talk about that more in a moment. I believe in teaching people a pattern for soul winning. But one of the most glorious things that happens to me in soul winning is when uh, I'm talking to someone and it's not going according to the pattern and they're asking some questions or they've got a background and it's, it's just not something that's right there with Romans 5, 8 and Romans 6, 23. And suddenly the Spirit of God begins to recall to me messages and verses and principles and, and situations that I can use in leading this person to Christ. It's a great thing to be a Spirit-filled soul winner. And to know that God was at work in that living room as that man or that woman accepted Christ as Savior. At the age of five, a little girl named Hannah made an insightful statement about her newfound faith. She told her mother, she said, Mother, I think Jesus has moved out of my heart. And with much curiosity, her mother said, Well, well, what are you talking about? She replied, she said, Mommy, I think he moved into my throat because all I want to do is talk about Jesus. And some of us need to let it move out of our head and into our throat. We need to remember uh, to let the Spirit of God prompt us. The Holy Spirit purifies and teaches, and the Holy Spirit unifies, Philippians 2.1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, being of one mind. You know, it's a wonderful thing uh, to serve in a church where there's unity. And I thank the Lord for the spirit of unity at Lancaster Baptist. And I thank the Lord for what he's doing in your church. And I I want to encourage uh, every one of you men that are here with your pastor, perhaps, or ladies here with your your pastor and pastor's wife, uh, to be the peacemaker, to be the person that's that's, uh, uh, making sure that you're keeping short accounts with God so that the Spirit of God can work clearly and easily uh, through you. And so uh, the Spirit of God prompts us in that direction. And then fourthly, the Holy Spirit of God provides the fruit, John 15, 5. 
5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. And Jesus is the vine, and, and uh, it is through his power that we have the strength and the resource. One of the hardest things for me to learn in ministry and to remember, and Brother John touched on it a moment ago, I'm not the vine. Jesus is the vine. And we must have his power. The Holy Spirit guides our witness. And then the Holy Spirit, secondly, empowers our witness. When it comes to soul winning, when it comes to giving generously, as our folks have over these years, given now nearly $80 million to building programs, and last year, uh, I think a million seven hundred thousand dollars to missions. When it comes to giving, when it comes to soul winning, when it comes to separation, we have found the greatest emphasis need not be placed on money or standards. It needs to be placed on the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Being full of the Spirit and following the leadership of the Spirit in giving. That's why it's called the grace of giving. That's why we believe that separation is one of the graces of the Christian life. And we believe that as we grow in grace, uh, that there will come a power from the Holy Spirit of God. And this is so needed in soul winning. Acts 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. I love the story of, uh, of uh, Ethiopian eunuch and Philip going to him in Acts 28, 29. It says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip did what? He ran thither. He ran thither. Now, does the Holy Spirit still speak to our hearts about witnessing? It speaks to my heart that way. If, if we're walking in the Spirit, it's very difficult to get to a restaurant, to get to a public place, to be, to be around people at City Hall. It's very difficult to be around just about anybody and not remember that they will spend eternity in heaven or hell. And the way I remember that is not because I'm so smart. It's because the one living within me reminds me of this constantly. And the Spirit said, by the way, the Spirit has not stopped saying this. We have stopped listening. God deliver us from pastors who do not go soul winning and deacons who do not go soul winning and, and staff members. Listen, I don't want to sound mean or arbitrary or make you think ill of this place, but listen, we would not have a school teacher in this ministry that's not actively involved in soul winning. You say, well, do they do it because you require it or because the Holy Spirit uh, touches their heart? I hope it's because the Holy Spirit's touching their heart. I really do. And I believe in most cases it is, but I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I just believe that when Jesus said, go into all the world, this was the mandate that was given to the church by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if you're sitting here thinking, well, you know, my gift is uh, I take care of the finances and my gift is I run the sports ministry and my gift is this and that. We're not talking about spiritual gifts, sir. We're talking about a commandment. And it's not from the church, it's from the Lord Jesus. And with that commandment, he gave power. And that power is from the Holy Spirit. And he wants to have people like Philip, who when the Spirit says, hey, give a track to the waitress. Hey, give a track to your neighbor. Hey, go to that one. Look, at just open up your newspaper and read the obituary. And go to the families that had someone die. There are plenty of people to go talk to. Amen. And when he says to you to go talk to them, we need to run to our assignment. We need to say, yes, sir, and do what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. We must immediately respond. We must do what he has told us to do. Terry and I had um, a little layover in Dubai several months ago, and it happened because uh, we were kissed by so many wonderful people in Egypt prior to landing in Dubai. And uh, because of that, we tested positive for COVID. And so we had to do a 10-day quarantine in, in a, a hotel room. Terry was 10 days. I think I was four days. Then I got to get out and go get food for her and things. And so uh, we, uh, we had, prior to that, a wonderful day uh, or two in, uh, in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi and just enough time to learn a little bit uh, with our friend, uh, Brother Mansoor here, about 
out of that country and the United Arab Emirates and, and so forth. And so I was given a book from rags to riches. It was a story of the country. I read that while I was in the, in the hotel room. I laid on the bed. You looked straight up. They had this little arrow that pointed to Mecca so you knew where to, where to pray, which direction to pray toward. And that was, that was very interesting. By the way, it's convicting to be in an Islamic country when all of a sudden certain times come, they start bowing down on the floor praying to Mecca. And uh, we're, we're too embarrassed to pass a the track. They just prostrate right on the floor and, 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 uh, and praying toward Mecca. But I learned some things about the country, and, and uh, Terry never did test negative. She tested positive the whole time, but after 10 days, we were free at last. And uh, we got on the plane, came home, and, and you know, you go through those times, and I'm telling you, I, I wondered so, so much about, what, Lord, why are you delaying us here, and what's this all about? And, and uh, I, I wasn't real patient the first few days, but anyways, we got back, and we had some good, good times at church here, good services, and it was time for a uh, family vacation. And we took our family, and we were down by the coast, and... and uh, uh, we're, we're walking, walking along a sidewalk at a, at a resort there and just, uh, just enjoying being with our family. Here was this man and his wife and she was wearing the hijab and I could tell they most likely were Middle Eastern and, and uh, something really amazing happened in my heart in Egypt and, and there in, uh, in the United Arab Emirates. And that is that God just really put a burden on my heart for Islamic people. And just, just everybody that I spoke with over there, and everybody was so kind and taking tracks or at least talking about Jesus. And, and, uh, and, the, and the Lord had worked in my heart. And here's this couple. And so uh, just so happened I was, I was wearing a T-shirt that said Dubai. And uh, we're just kind of walking along there. And, and, uh, and I, I said to this couple, I said, hi, how are you guys doing? And, and uh, we began talking with them. And, and uh, this gentleman turned out was the... Uh, uh, he's the uh, director of the Sovereign Wealth Fund for the United Arab Emirates. He invests in, and, uh, for their country and so forth. We began talking. I began to tell him about from rags to riches, the history of his country, the tallest building, the biggest aquariums, and just bragging on his country. We just started hitting it off, you know, and uh, talking about these things. And, and I would have never really known a lot of that had I not visited and had I not had 10 days to read about it and watch the information channel and, and all that type of stuff, you know. And... Um, and you know, the Lord, the Lord said to me, you need a witness to this man. And, uh, and, and the, these, these were people that we really had not a lot in common with, and from, in, in fact, nothing in common with them. But the Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart. And uh, Terry and I took them to dinner uh, that next evening, and we were able to share the gospel with them at that restaurant. And tell them about our Savior and, and, and go through. And they did not get saved uh, that night. We left a gift with them before we left. They told us about how they go to Mecca every year. They told us about their standards and the righteousness of their religion. We told them about Jesus and how we believe he's God's son and why. He texted me just last week. He said, I, I just got the book you sent. I sent him one of my books, The Burden Bearer. It's a book about Christ and how he bears burdens and and uh, he said, I got the book. He said, I'm reading it. He said, I'm, I'm so glad we met. He said, I'm sorry about your experience in Dubai having to be in the hotel. We want you and your wife to come for a proper reception here with us. I want you to meet some people. He's personal friends with the various government officials. He told us, he said, if you, if you want to start a Christian school or a church, we, I want to help you with that. By the way, I don't know where that conversation is going to go, but I'm glad when the Holy Spirit said, talk to the man. I'm praying he'll be saved. I'm praying a graduate of West Coast Baptist College will go to that country with 11 million citizens. Only 1 million of them are Emiratis. The other 10 million are from uh, the Philippines and India and Pakistan. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I don't know what God's going to do with that, but I know when the Spirit of God says, speak, that we're supposed to speak. And we see that this is what the Spirit does. We must immediately respond. We must scripturally respond. And this is what God has called us to do. We see that Philip ran to him. Uh, we see that he, he read to him uh, from the prophet Isaiah. And he said, understandest thou what thou readest? And, and we understand from this that uh, the Spirit of God was moving on Philip's heart. Spurgeon said, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire, we are useless. 
this. We must stop quenching the Holy Spirit. We must teach our people to be filled with the Spirit, uh, to collaborate with the Spirit, to yield to the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit of God is moving us, whether it's starting a new ministry, whether it's some of you men that are in a city where there's 30 or 40 Baptist churches, and the Lord might even burden your heart about this state while you're here. The Holy Spirit does these types of things. Whether it's starting some new ministry at your church, whether it's perhaps becoming a missionary, whether it's talking to the new neighbor across the street, whatever it is, we must understand soul winning is not first and foremost about an organized program. It is first and foremost about yielded lives, about saying yes to the Holy Spirit and letting him then lead us. Notice, secondly, we must labor through the local church. I believe in the local New Testament Baptist church. And I believe that the calling of the disciples was the beginning of the church. The empowerment of the church took place on the day of Pentecost. But I believe Jesus called out that first assembly. And it was to that assembly that he gave his great commission, Matthew chapter 28. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. By the way, that power, that word power is the Greek word excusia. It speaks of the fact that there are many realms of power, spiritually speaking, in this world. Many ranks of demons and demonic power. But Jesus said... There's a lot of realms of power, but Jesus said, I have all power. Aren't you thankful for that? He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. There's nothing you're going to face. There's no, there's no force. Listen, there's no governor. There's no uh, assembly. There's no law. Uh, there's no demonically inspired movement that can stop the church of the living God. All power is given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, again, this is not uh, some church standard. This is not some uh, uh, Baptist idea. This is Jesus Christ commissioning his church. This is why Dr. Curtis Hudson often said, the only alternative to soul winning is disobedience. It's the only alternative. Jesus Christ has mandated this to the church. Now, when I think of this matter of laboring through the church, I want you to note letter A, we must labor with clarity. We must labor with clarity. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must give biblical clarity as it pertains to the needs of mankind. I personally am not against at all making the gospel clear, uh, making it applicably relevant. I'm not against uh, uh, using the word gospel to explain the centrality of Jesus Christ in our lives. But what bothers me is, as I said last night, when people talk about gospel ministry and they're never sharing the gospel. And we must open the word of God. We must have the word of God on our gospel tracks. We must open our soul winner New Testament. We must take the word to the streets and take the word to people in those streets. Romans 1.16, when Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he's speaking of glorying in the gospel, preaching the gospel. And since this conference began some uh, 30 years ago, we have emphasized that, that Jesus Christ is the goal of the Christian life. He is the, he is the mark that we're pressing for. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. So if you've been put in trust with the gospel, you're going to speak the gospel. As we've been put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Now listen, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our heart. This whole woke ideology is nothing but a man-pleasing movement. Now, you listen to me. I, I, I did my time having people say for years, you know, those independent Baptists, they're just trying to please men. I heard all that. And there was some truth to it. There's been some man-centeredness in our movement. But I'm here to tell you today that for those who said that for decades, we're watching them create and live in the most man-centered movement ever to come to Christianity. 
This woke movement is a man-pleasing movement, and they're pleasing the wrong men, by the way. You always please the wrong men if you're focusing on men. But they are trying to please a carnal culture. They're bowing to the culture and, and talking of the gospel, but never confronting them with the fact that they're sinners. They want to converse with the LBGTQ. They want to talk about having women pastors. They want to get all into these woke ideas. And the fact of the matter is they're trying to please people that they can never please. I like what Dr. Getz wrote in his book, Homiletics from the Heart. God may bless our homiletical outline, our illustrations and stories, but he does not promise to do so. He only promises to bless his word. And any ministry philosophy that is tapering down on the word of God and giving Christianity light and Bible light and afraid to offend, any, anything that is centered on this type of a man-pleasing philosophy is bound to fail. We must stand in the pulpit and preach for an audience of one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. We must labor with clarity. Secondly, we must labor in partnership. We must labor in partnership. We must labor in partnership with God himself. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 and 9, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. I was speaking with Dr. Kim at my home Saturday night. Dr. Daniel Kim preached for us Sunday night. He's pastored the Bible Baptist Church of Seoul, Korea for 62 years. Probably, if not the godliest, one of the most godly men I've ever known. For years, he has taken every Thursday night, all night, to pray. All night. He said, uh, Brother Chapel, I pray for you, especially on Thursday night. But he said, I pray for you every day. I said, Brother Kim, that's too much. He said, how can I say I love you and not pray for you? A great man of God. And uh, a couple of us gathered around him, and we said, now... Brother Kim, after 62 years, have you had seasons in your ministry with great trials? Have you ever had those trials affect you physically? Have you ever had times of anxiety or difficulty and, and you just wondered what God was doing? And, and I'll never forget what he said there in my backyard the other night. He said, oh, though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed. What we need in those times is the renewal of God. A lot of times the anxiety and the burnout comes because we're trying to do it too much in our own flesh. Aren't you glad that we labor together with God? And may we be renewed in that this week. We labor with God, but then secondly, we labor with one another. We need to see our church family as the team that God has assembled, and we need to recognize as pastors we are equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. I think one of the most beautiful pictures of the church is found in Mark 2, verse 1. And again, he entered into a Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house, and straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them, and they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was, what does the next free word say? Which was what? born of four. Born of four. Sometimes that's what it takes. It takes that faithful soul winner that knocked on the door and thought they failed, but they left the track. It takes that faithful witness at work to invite that person again to the church. And now the curiosity's developed. Then it takes that faithful teenager there on the street that goes to the church that befriended their kid. And then maybe it takes a faithful bus rider, and there's, there's a bus from that church. And we don't know. Uh, we just know that one plants and one waters. We know that one grabbed this handle and one grabbed this handle and this handle and this handle. But I like to view our church as a team of people bringing others to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We must work in partnership with one another I want to say again to the staff and the deacons and the laymen, work with your pastor. Listen to what he's saying after this conference and, 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 and do your best to implement what it is that God is doing on his heart. We live in a very disruptive society. There's plenty of disruption. You don't need to be the disruptor. You need to be the supporter of the man of God. I get so tired of some of these men. I go to church and, you know, I'll walk into, walk into church and some deacon or someone will shake my hand and say, hey, we're glad you're here, Brother Chapel. My job's to keep the preacher humble. <laughs> 
I always say the same thing. The devil's very busy doing that already. Now, if you want to help the devil, have at it. But I don't think your job is to keep the pastor humble. Your job is to help him win the city to Christ. Oh, that we would recognize this. My brother alluded to the U.S. News headline, 42% of pastors last week, according to the survey, 42% are considering resignation after COVID-19. It was a challenging time. If you still have your same pastor after COVID, I might suggest to you to love him a little bit. Give him a raise. How's that sound? For keeping him humble. Go soul winning with him. Do what one of our deacons now in heaven did for 36 years every Sunday night, giving me a hug after the evening service and saying, that's the exact message I needed, pastor. Thank you for that. We've got to work together in this. Pastors should not have to say, uh, I sure hope some of you might come soul winning. He ought to know that your heart is there. We must labor in partnership. Thirdly, we must labor with a process. A process to involve every member and reach every guest for Christ. We need to be reminded of the fact that Jesus said, go ye. He didn't say, go y'all. He said, go ye. Every member, a minister, say it with me. Every member, say it again. Every member, every saint, a servant, say it with me. Every a servant, every saint, a soul winner, every member, a minister. God says, I want you, go ye into all the world. Philippians 4 and verse 9, these things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. This is why pastors need to be involved in soul winning because people do what people see. And he says, the things that you've seen in me, go out and do those things. They, they see you go to your fellowship meeting. They see you go to maybe the golf course. They see you do this or that. Nothing wrong with fellowship, nothing wrong with golf. But do they see you going out soul winning? So well, am I just doing it just for them? Well, it's not wrong for a shepherd to set an example. Paul said, I want you to do the things that you've been seeing me do. I think everything we do as pastors has a training effect. The way we live and the way we witness ought to be encouraging others in this matter of soul winning. Now let's talk about this process. Number one, the process of outreach. The process of outreach. We like to say a dream without a plan is a wish. It's only a wish. If you dream of seeing you know, some souls saved and a great church established, but you have no process wherewith you might accomplish that dream, then it's really just a wish. It's not really a biblical dream or vision at all. What are some of the things that we need to consider with our process of outreach? The first thing I, I want you to note here, and some of this may be in the notes already, is that we need to continuously cultivate our field of souls. Cultivate the field of souls. My granddad was a farmer in Colorado, and Stephen alluded to that a moment ago. And my uncle carries on the farm, some of my cousins, several thousand acres. And those same acres, for now, I would guess 60 years, some of them, year after year, cultivating, 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 planting, weeding, cultivating, On that farm, there are some piles of rocks at the end of those rows. And every time I see them, I think of the labor of my grandfather. There'd be a big rock back in his implement. He'd have to jump off that tractor, get that rock, put it in a big bucket on the front of the tractor, go to the end of the row, jump off the tractor again, get that 100-pound rock off of that uh, bucket and throw it in that pile. And he did that for his entire life, just lifting those rocks off of that field, keeping that field so that they could get a crop out of it. Sometimes we have to pick up rocks, and that might be something bad that happened in your church, but you got out in front of it and you dealt with the sin so that your church wasn't besmirched in the community. Sometimes it means you've got to go to that woman that's gossiping or that man that's fallen back into sin. Sometimes you've got to preach that tough message. Sometimes you've got to talk to that deacon whose spirit isn't right, but you're cultivating in that way through your pastoring and you're constantly doing your best to keep the rocks out of the field because it's hard for beans to grow underneath a hundred pound rock. 
And the other way we cultivate is by getting out in the field then. After the field has been cultivated, we like to get out and sow the seed. And we do this in a lot of different ways, cultivating and preparing for our soul winners. Sometimes it's a radio uh, campaign, sometimes billboards, sometimes newsletters that are sent out, sometimes a television uh, broadcast or commercial. Uh, and then we have annual events that we host as a church. And these annual events are meant to help us with uh, cultivating the field of souls where we work and keeping the church name and the gospel uh, forefront in the minds of our community. In January, we start our, our year the second Saturday with what we call SOS, Saturday Outreach Spectacular. What is that? The second, the second Saturday of January, we feed everybody that'll come out soul winning. By the way, no college kids are here then. We feed everybody that'll come out soul winning, give them a breakfast and have a great time of fellowship. And then we stand up and give them a lesson on how to be a soul winner and how to go out. Uh, we give them a packet of gospel tracts. We give them a map uh, where they're going to go soul winning. We get them partnered up with someone that's been out before. And normally we'll start the year with several hundred people, second Saturday of the year, starting the year out soul winning. This is just how we cultivate the field of souls. We do the same thing in February. In March, uh, we have a great outreach to our local prison and sheriff's departments and law enforcement. In April, uh, we uh, have a special new move-in Sunday where we uh, really emphasize all of those. We have some lists that have moved into the area. We have our Easter outreach. Uh, in May, we have our First Responders Appreciation Day. In uh, June, we have an SOS. In July, another one. In August, uh, and uh, uh, through the summer, just a lot of door knocking through that period of time. Some folks, of course, on vacation. Uh, in September, we come in and we have a big fall kickoff. Again, a big breakfast and door knocking. Normally, we'll knock on about 10 to 15,000 doors on those SOS Saturdays. By the way, uh, this will be our 20th year uh, to knock on over a half a million doors this year for the 20th year just going to every home over and again with the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Antelope Valley. October, we have our friend day, our new move-in Sunday again. Uh, we have some uh, community events that we get involved in. November, we have our Thanksgiving basket outreach. We do another law enforcement outreach. Then, of course, Christmas. Uh, Christmas outreach, Christmas on the Boulevard, various different things things of this nature. All of this is just kind of the ongoing cultivating in the community, staying present, being involved in the community. Now, that is the cultivation. Secondly, is the canvassing in the communities. This is where we're specifically uh, going from door to door, these special events. But now we're canvassing throughout the community, uh, mapping our community, knocking on doors throughout the community, all throughout the year. Now, let me encourage you. Get a map in your lobby, and, and as you're door knocking this fall, highlight what streets you've been to. Let your church see that they're a part of something great. Let them see that you're communicating with the entire community the gospel of Jesus Christ. So important that you are not just going out to get you one, not just going out to the same neighborhood over and over again, but that you're systematically covering your entire community, every part of it, every neighborhood with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we see that there must be a process for outreach, and uh, there's no substitute for getting out in your community and talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ, having some special events, maybe to bring them in, like a few that we have mentioned here. Then I want to speak to you about the process of follow-up, the process of follow-up. You see on the screen here how we get involved with our uh, canvassing and our door knocking and giving out the maps, giving out the gospel tracts. But now what do we do as they start visiting the church? By the way, you can't knock on 10,000 doors in a Saturday without having some visitors. You're not just knocking doors, you're talking to people. You're not just talking to people, you're asking questions. You're asking them to be your guests. You're asking them if they know if they died, where they'd spend eternity. You're asking, as long as they'll talk, you're asking those questions and giving Bible answers. But now, uh, how do we process all of this uh, as we go through the year? Let me give you a few thoughts here. A couple of things I want to challenge you with. First of all, start two soul winning seasons annually. Start two soul winning seasons annually. We process our soul winning ministry by starting in January and starting normally in September. This year it's October the 1st, where we sign people up to be a part of the soul winning ministry. So every January, every fall, we're signing people up in the adult classes is where we do this. I passed this card out in the class I taught Sunday, and I asked everyone to fill it out right in the class. Sign up. Are you going to come Thursday? Are you going to come Saturday? 
Brother First, so our soul winning directors pairing up the new ones with the more experienced ones. But we start anew in the new year and we start again in the fall signing people up. And I cannot reiterate enough the importance of this. Secondly, we have a training class for those that sign up. And for those that are just new soul winners, we have a basic class where we teach them, take it personally. We give them this book. I like to put books in their hands. I like to take them through things that they can study. And then we take the experienced soul winners through an advanced soul winning on how to witness to Islamic people, how to witness to Jehovah's Witness people, whatever the case might be. After the class, we pair them up and they go out two by two into the community teaching and reaching people with the gospel. So have a training class. Uh, then. Uh, we assign partners for them, as I mentioned a moment ago, and uh, we produce calls for them according to the life stage based on Sunday guest list. Now, these soul winners that are getting partnered up, uh, sometimes they're doing door knocking, but a lot of times they're doing follow-up visits. They're following up on people that they have been assigned, someone that visited the church the week prior. And when we say life stage, it might be a young couple's class, 25 to 35, something like that. And we're going to take that call, might be a single adult, 28 years old. We're going to give that to some singles. They're going to go invite them to their class. They're going to talk to them about their soul and endeavor to lead them to Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we produce those calls and we distribute those calls in the soul winning meetings right at the end of the meeting. Sometimes with these calls, we will call and set an appointment at the home. Sometimes uh, uh, we on the staff will call ahead. Uh, and especially if we've met them, we have these guest tables on Sunday mornings and we invite people to go to the guest table and get a gift. And when they go to the guest table, we're kind of doing some research right there. We've trained our guest uh, receptionist to ask questions. Are you new in the area? Have you, uh, what kind of church are you from? Uh, uh, are you from a Baptist background? Try to figure out if they're saved, if they're not saved, if they're uh, professional, if they're uh, just uh, homeless, whatever the situation is. And they take notes and sometimes the staff will call ahead and say, we have uh, some folks from our young couples class that would like to talk to you about the class and talk to you about Jesus. And sometimes they set up the appointments in the home. Sometimes it's at a coffee shop. Uh, sometimes we can't get a hold of them. We still go to the doors. We still knock on the doors in those cases as well. Now then we keep a master sheet of all these calls. And this is something I tell my, my college class. Every Friday, I get a sheet, pastors, every Friday with the name of every visitor from Sunday whether they were visited on Thursday, what happened on the visit on Thursday. Every Friday, you say with everything else going on around here, that's the center nerve of everything that's happening around here is how are we doing on reaching souls for Christ? And if somebody wasn't visited on a Thursday, we reassign it so that Saturday they get visited. I'm telling you, every visitor of this church, I put my eyes on their name and their address, and I know who visited them on Thursday or on Saturday. And once a month, I look at every visitor from the past 30 days, and I ask, who's the person that is visiting this person? It says here, Dr. Mark Rasmussen, but it says he hasn't been to their house yet. And I'll call Dr. Rasmussen. I have somebody call, Dr. R, what's going on? He'll say, no, I've been to the house, but they weren't home, or this or that happened. But I'm tenacious about knowing the whereabouts, the spiritual condition of of everybody that's ever visited the Lancaster Baptist Church. Because if I don't care about that, and if I don't steward that, I don't believe God will send more people to the Lancaster Baptist Church. So we, we cultivate the feel of souls by being out and being involved in these events and knocking on doors. And then we, we process the names of these visitors and we very meticulously follow up on getting these folks the gospel and leading them to Christ. And so uh, we have at first a process of outreach that begins with cultivation. And then we process the follow-up of those that uh, have visited the church. Number three, we also have a process of assimilating those into the church that have visited and have been saved. And here's how we do that. First, we invite and enroll every guest into a connection group. Every guest is invited into a connection group or Sunday school class. Now those groups provide at least three things. Your Sunday school class should provide at least these three things besides teaching, of course. They should provide availability. As the church gets past about 200, the pastor needs help and needs other leaders that are available for the class. Secondly, they provide accountability. This isn't all in your notes, but write it down. It's good. They provide availability. They provide accountability. It's vital 
that someone's letting them know when they're missed and staying in touch with them. And then, of course, they also provide acceptance. Acceptance. Acceptance is the optimum environment for growth. That's what Stephen talked about this morning. They need to know that they're accepted. They need to know that they're loved. And that's happening in our small group classes. Now, Dr. Lee Robertson taught me to enroll everybody that visits the church. Brother Tom Sexton's here with us. He's going to do a session on lessons he learned from Lee Robertson, a man who baptized 60,000 people, a great ministry. And one of his philosophies was everybody that visits the church needs to get enrolled into a Sunday school class. Even if they're not saved, they need to get enrolled. They need to have a place where they know they're welcome and they need to be enrolled into that Sunday school class. And so we invite them to enroll. And when we're out in those homes, we say, we'd like to have you come be a part of our couples class this Sunday. And a lot of times we'll enroll them right on the spot. Can we enroll you in our class? And we want them to know they're welcome there. Even if they didn't get saved that night, we want to get that win. We want to get a win that they're going to come and visit visit the class, all right? Then in this process of assimilation, we encourage every uh, member of these groups to enroll in discipleship, to enroll in the continued discipleship. So here's someone, someone knocked on their door as we're cultivating. We, they, they knock on that door, they come into the church and they, they visit the church. Now, uh, we get the list on Monday morning. Here's John Doe. He's 28 years old. Thursday night, we're back in the home. We're talking to him. Maybe it's a Saturday because he works swing shift, but we're not going to lose him. We're back there talking to him, either leading him to Christ or finding out his faith background and then inviting him. The best case scenario is the first week he came to the worship service, the next week he's in a small group and the worship service, and he's already starting to feel at home. There's already the bonding taking place in that way. Once they've come to that uh, Sunday school class or that connection group for a week or two, we're going to immediately begin speaking to them about being discipled. We're going to tell them that on Wednesday night, we have a discipleship opportunity for them. Someone from this Sunday school class would like to meet with them over a cup of coffee, single with a single. Uh, they might meet, uh, if it's a married couple, we'll have a lady with a lady, a man with a man. But we're going to take them through continue discipleship. And a lot of times we'll begin with someone that maybe is not saved yet, but the first lesson is about salvation. Normally, though, they've been saved by this point, and we're inviting them to be a part of the discipleship program. About 680 churches are using Continue, and one of the great problems we've had with many of our Baptist churches is attrition because of the fact that we didn't take the time to disciple, and this is a great way to get people rooted and grounded in Christ, and so we encourage them in to Continue. We also are encouraging them at the same time frame to be baptized. If they've not been baptized, we're working on that right there that first week as well. Somewhere along this process, as we've seen them saved and they're in a class and we're now, we're now discipling them, they're going to hear about something we call the core class or the new members class. And I want you to think about this core class. We do it four times a year. Some of you might do it four times a year or three times a year. I don't know. Uh, we welcomed, I don't know, I think about maybe about 70 new members stood across the front here Sunday night. These were the people in the core class from the sun, uh, summer season. These were the people that were uh, brought through the three-week core class. That's where I teach them what is a Baptist? Uh, what is the doctrine of the church? How does the church operate? And we really acclimate them to the DNA of a fundamental Bible-believing church. And so so uh, that's done through the core class. And uh, we have a secretary uh, that helps us with all this assimilation process. Now, uh, it, it's something that we must have a passion for. I've often said, look it, you may not be great on the computers, but if you have a three by five card and passion, you can do what we're talking about right now. A lot of times I'll, I'll ask for a chart and this secretary and uh, brother Jacob Fleming oversees the assimilation. I'll say, I want to see a chart of the last 100 visitors at Lancaster Baptist Church, and I want to know, are they saved, baptized, in a class, in discipleship? Have they been to the core class? How are we doing? I recently did this with Brother Collins, our Spanish pastor. We took uh, this uh, spreadsheet, every name on this column of who had visited the church, and then this way, where are they? By the way, if you don't have a lot of X's on the far right of this sheet, meaning saved, baptized, in Sunday school, in discipleship, through the core class, if you're not getting them through that process, they're probably over at First Assembly or out at the lake or somewhere else. They're probably not in your Sunday night service. 
but it's going to take a pastor, it's going to take an under-shepherd that is tenacious about this. I mean, he's as tenacious about this as he is how fast he rode his bike on Friday. He's as tenacious about this as he is how fast he can run a mile or his golf score. Somebody help me here. I'm not being mean. I'm just saying we keep track of stuff. Let's keep track of the main stuff. And that's reaching people with the gospel. Our ministry path is kind of simple. I've been talking to you about it. Guys, if you'll throw it up here for me real quick. I want to just talk through the ministry path. And, and this is how we try to help our members of our church realize where we're headed. First, we want to get people to this worship service. All the door knocking, we're inviting people to church. We want to get them in. And I think it's good for unsafe people to watch us worship God. And we get together and we, we worship the Lord From that, we want to involve them in community. That's why we invite them to the connection groups. And Steve talked about that this morning. While they're in that community, we start speaking to them about making some commitments. I mentioned those commitments, continued discipleship and the core class. We want to make those commitments. Those are membership commitments. In the core class, we give them the church constitution, the church uh, statement of faith. Our statement of faith says that marriage is between a man and a woman. It talks about these types of sin issues. And they sign the statement of faith before they become a member at Lancaster Baptist Church. When they're baptized, if they haven't signed the statement of faith, they're still not a member. They're added to the church, but they're not a voting member of Lancaster Baptist Church until they make the commitment at the core class to the doctrine of the church. And in today's society, that little step that I just shared with you is vitally important. Our ministry path is worship, community, commitment. Then, after they've been discipled, We want to teach them how to get involved in soul winning, in a ministry, in serving, which obviously leads to the fifth and final, which is our outreach. And that's our ministry path. And uh, a, a, a dream without a plan is a wish. That's our plan. I just shared some of it with you. We must labor this way through the local church. So we must yield to the Holy Spirit. We must labor through the local church, collaborating together as a team. Look at it. It might be you and your wife. It might be you and one assistant pastor. It might be you and one layman. But the two of you need to get tenacious about every person that visits your church and where are they on the path and what are you doing to bring them along in their spiritual growth. And this is the passion of my life right here. This is what it's all about. 37 years later, this is what matters most to me. Getting people saved, baptized, discipled, and fully committed followers of Jesus Christ in Southern California living for God. That's what it's all about. That's my life. I don't mind preaching out. I don't mind doing other stuff. But this is my life right here. It's being a pastor. It's helping people make these steps and do what God wants them to do. So we must yield to the Holy Spirit. We must labor through the local church. Thirdly, we must partner with others for missions and church planting. We must partner for others with others. Like the churches of Macedonia who gave. I think of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, how they gave for the need at the church at Corinth. Years ago at leadership conference, I shared about a little booklet that I found uh, over in London, England one day, and I went to the uh, Churchill War Rooms, uh, not far from Buckingham Palace. And in the Churchill War Rooms, they had a lot of different uh, relics and replicas from World War II. And one of them was a booklet entitled, Instructions for American Servicemen in Britain in 1942. Instructions for American servicemen in Britain in 1942. And I thought, wow, interesting. They're telling our boys how to, you know, how to, uh, how their deportment should be while they're here in the war. And pastors and Christian leaders, I want you to listen to what this book said, because we're at war. By the way, not with each other. Here's what it said. You are going to Great Britain as a part of an allied offensive to meet Hitler and beat him on his own ground. America and Britain are allies. Hitler knows that they are both powerful countries, tough and resourceful. Here's some things to remember. Number one, this is no time to fight old wars. If you come from an Irish American family, you may think of the English as persecutors of the Irish, or you may think of them as enemies. But we must remember this is no time to fight old wars. I don't know how to tell some of you this. The young 30-year-old pastors, they're not interested in the old wars of fundamentalism. 
They, they, I, had, I had entire classes in Bible college about how this pastor split with this pastor. And it was interesting. It was church history. But honestly, uh, that, that's not what really gets us excited these days is, is these old wars. Number two, don't be a show off. The British dislike bragging and showing off. Number three, keep out of arguments. Once again, look and listen and learn before you start telling the British how much better to do things. The British don't know how to make a good cup of coffee. You don't know how to make a good cup of tea. It's an even swap. <laughs> Number four, it's always impolite to criticize your hosts. Number five, it's military stupid to criticize your allies. We need to figure something out. Anybody that is without compromising preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ standing for the truth of the Word of God, whether you can have them preach for you or not is another issue. Okay, that's another lesson. But anybody that's winning souls in America today, I'm thankful for them. Amen. And especially you men that hold the same doctrine, use the same Bible, all these types of things. We need to remember that we must collaborate to win souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, the booklet said, remember there's a war on. I don't read a lot of social media. I slightly touched on that last night. But sometimes when I do, I am amazed what preachers talk about on social media. And I ask myself, do they not realize there's people going to hell right now? I remember Brother Sisk after, after 9-1-1, after the trade centers were bombed, two days after the trade centers were bombed, a man sends me an email wanting to challenge and talk to me about something. He said, in fact, he said, I just need to talk to you about one of the songs that one of your groups sang had an upward slide. Uh, when I read the email, of course, I had to run to the music guys. What is an upward slide? <laughs> of course, they didn't know. They didn't, they didn't go to Bob Jones. <laughs> Come on, some of you Bob Jones guys, smile at me here. Come on. <laughs> We didn't know what it was. What's an upward slide? I called Ron Hamilton. I said, Ron, I got this email. I want to be, I want to answer it, but I don't know what we did. Now, some of you guys can tell me afterwards, because I still don't really know what it is. But here's what I did know. Our country had just been attacked. People in this city were so afraid of the next bomb dropping People were just walking into this church crying to pray. We were, we were leading people to the Lord. We probably led 15 to 20 people to the Lord in those first two days. We're in here trying to lead people to the Lord, do all we can do. And a pastor writes me an email about an upward slide. There's good, there's better, and there's best. And I'm not minimizing having good, sound music in the church. I don't want carnal music. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. But I don't want to have such a dimensional thought process that leads me into these types of things, especially in moments when people need the gospel. Amen. So I want to close with this. We must partner with others for missions and church planting. A, for church planting. Why church planting? Church plant attendance grows 21% per year for five years after the church plant. Churches grow 21% for five years after the church plant. A new church gains 60 to 80% of its membership from new conversions. 60 to 80% from new conversions. Churches that are over 10 to 15 years old gain 80 to 90% of their new members by transfer from other congregations. So we've got to work together to start new churches. We've got to see more churches getting planted. Amen. Acts 13, and there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. Have you done that lately? 
Has there been a time lately where you laid your hands on one of your very best men and sent him off? That's how missions got started. That's how churches get planted. Very, very clearly. The Holy Spirit calls the man. The local church sends and supports the man. Partner churches support and encourage. Uh, church planners communicate with the churches. Churches ultimately become autonomous. And to get these churches started, we have to work together. And by the way, they might come from Bob Jones. They might come from some Maranatha. They might come from Hiles Anderson. I really don't care where they come from. If they're doctrinally straight and have a passion for souls, we want to help them get churches started. You say, well, but, but one might have a little bit different this way. One might have a little different this way. They're all going to be different. And finally, I finally figured that out. But if they're preaching the same gospel and they want to go to San Francisco, I want to help them go there. That's the spirit that we need to have. If they have to be from your college or from your fellowship before you support them, then you need to grow in your understanding of what it means to collaborate to get churches planted. I would look at, I don't care where you went to college. We're starting something I'll talk about tomorrow, California for Christ. We've been saving up money to give to people that will come out here and, and to give monthly support. And we've got 50 pastors signed up to be partners to help anybody that'll come out here. And I told them when we started, I said, this isn't from West Coast Baptist College. I said, I don't care what college they come from. I don't care what the background is. If they have the doctrine that we have and they want to start a church in California, we're going to be on their side. Because we're desperate to see God do something. It's so important. So for church planting, we must collaborate. Secondly, for world evangelism. Hudson Taylor said, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. We need church planting missionaries. Church planting missionaries. We support over 200 missionaries, and we have a few uh, ministries that we support that aren't church planting, but I really believe you can dilute your missions dollar if you're giving the majority of it to other than church planting. I believe that New Testament missions is church planting missions, church planting and soul winning. So, so we want to establish church planting missions program. And uh, we, we evaluate every missionary individually. Again, we have missionaries probably from 40 different colleges, probably from 20 different boards. We, we don't look at all those other things primarily. We look at two things. We look at the man and his doctrine, and we look at his local church. Those are the first two things we look at. Who is the man? What's his doctrine? Who's his pastor? I don't, I, don't, doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't matter to me who his mission director is. What matters to me is who's his pastor. I want to know that he's, he's doctrinally sound, that he's a good man, and that he has a good pastor. I'm going to call that pastor. Tell me about this guy. Is he a good guy? And, and so we evaluate the missionary individually. We study his doctrine. We look at his local church. I do consider the missions agency. There are different agencies. I know the doctrine, for example, at BIMI, it's straight. I know the requirements for the missionaries. I'm comfortable with that. If it's another agency that I don't know, I want to know what their policies are and so forth. In other words, I want to steward the money we're about to give. If we're going to give money and prayer and go out soul winning there, I want to, I want to know. But I'm not, look, at, I'm not trying to scrutinize it so that I don't have to support them. I want to support them. I've told a half a dozen men in this room, this last night, we'll support you. Church planners and missionaries. I know last night I said that to six men. I have no idea uh, what their college or board is, but I knew their names. Uh, I knew from their testimony what they believed, and they told me, this is my pastor. I said, we want to get behind you. It wasn't a lot of these questionnaires that pastors send is to try to get people off their missionary roster. I want people on our missionary roster. That's how God blesses our church. Amen. So we want to do this through church planning missionaries. And then finally, sometimes we collaborate with strategic partners. Philippians 1.27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, I'm not interested in the social justice movement, and neither are you. The social justice movement is just liberalism recapped. It's just liberalism all over again. And uh, that's not something that we want to be a part of. 
There's a lot of missions projects that aren't scriptural. They're not biblically fruitful. But there are some opportunities to advance the gospel that maybe through a project of some kind or a parachurch ministry of some kind. And while our main hub of what we do is church planning missionaries, there may be something that you can do elsewise, such as sending an outreach team to help the church planner or uh, going overseas on a missions trip or partnering with a public school Bible club. We have six Bible clubs like that in high schools here in the Antelope Valley. We find a Christian teacher. We get workers to go and give gifts to the kids and teach them from the Word of God. Sometimes there may be a worthy parachurch outreach, such as uh, the scripture emphasis that BIMI did uh, with Papua New Guinea, and a lot of us could get involved in that. Or uh, some of you might do the Samaritan's Purse Christmas box. They'll let you put a King James Bible in there. They'll uh, uh, let you put gospel tracts or whatever the case might be. And there might be a way that just partnering with somebody else, you can get something to a foreign country that has the gospel on it. But what I'm saying is we need to be looking for ways within our biblical convictions to be able to get the gospel out around the world at, at any cost in order that people might be saved. It's going to take a collaborative effort yielded to the Holy Spirit, working together in the local church, and then working with pastors, and that we might see churches planted and missionaries sent around the world. I spent some time this summer up in uh, Oregon, and we went uh, we went over to Cannon Beach, Oregon. If you're ever up in the Northwest, one of the most beautiful spots in our country, just beautiful. And one day we were walking along the beach there, and it was kind of a cold, cloudy day, and and uh, we saw some people in these red jackets standing over uh, by a particular area of the bay, and they were they were protecting that area of the bay. And we went up to one lady, and she called them sea stars. I always called them starfish, but I think I've got a picture of the lady here, and. Her name, was, uh, her name was Mary. And this was her, her ministry, her mission. This was her sign, birds only. Birds only beyond this point. And in fact, the real reason I met Mary is because I went a little beyond the point. <laughs> and uh, that's how I met Mary. And she blew a whistle. And she started waving me like that. I said, oh, sorry, sorry. I got a little too close to the birds only area. And she said, don't go over there. She said, stay away from there. That's for the birds only. That's for the sea stars, the starfish. She said, you know, they are living creatures. She said, we need you to stay away from them. We're out here trying to save the birds and the sea stars. So don't go past these markers. And I began to talk to Mary. And I said, Mary, I'm sorry. Went past your sign. She said, well... This is very serious to me. She said, I come out here every Tuesday and Thursday during this tide. I come out here and I wear this red jacket and these signs because sea stars are living creatures. And she said, we've got to do everything we can to help the sea stars and help these birds. And she pointed to another group of people. They're guarding their area. I'm guarding my area. Every Tuesday and Thursday, we put on these jackets. We carry these signs for the sea stars. And you know where I'm going with this. Where are the Baptists? I'm not even going to require red jackets. Just a Tuesday or a Thursday. But what are they going to think when we knock on the door? What are they going to think when we give the track? What are they going to think when we ask about heaven or hell? People are more dedicated to the environment. They're more dedicated to starfish. And I think it's debatable whether they're living creatures, frankly. But, <laughs> but Mary will not have that debate with you. Dedicated to the starfish. Puts her jacket on right there, and we can't get a deacon. Philip was a deacon. When the Holy Spirit said go, he ran. We can't get the fourth grade teacher in the Christian school. We can't get the assistant pastor who's mostly the, the music guy. That's his gift. No, we're not talking spiritual gifts. Don't get on the gift thing. We're talking obedience right now. In fact, I think the music band should wear the red coat. 
Come on, hang in there with me. Not really, you don't have to. I don't care if you wear a red coat, red sweater. Are you going? We must collaborate for the gospel as never before. And I hope that you'll get some people on the ministry path, get them saved, get them trained, and that something we've said today will be a help and a blessing to you in reaching your community with the gospel of Christ.